Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis, and this is episode 132. So welcome. Glad to have you guys. I'm going to do something a little different today. We are going to talk about Hurricane Katrina. Next week is the 19th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And as some of you know who listened before and some of you don't know, I was in the Army National Guard at the time. And so I got deployed down to go to Hurricane Katrina. And so this is a story about the state of Louisiana and about being in the National Guard. But it's also a story about, you know, different police officers, different individuals who got stuck down in, in New Orleans during Katrina and in the Superdome specifically. And I want to tell that story for the first time. I've never really gone over it. I've talked about it in therapy. And then one time in grad school, I sat for a few hours and people asked me a bunch of questions. And I kind of told some of that story back in, it must have been 2008 or nine. So over the course of the last 19 years, I've, as a therapist, as a minister, as somebody who's gone back to New Orleans to do missions work and helped with the same areas in which, you know, I had to deal with all the devastation of Katrina, man, it's just been a, a huge thing on my heart and on my mind to tell. And it's surprising to me how many people don't know about it, haven't heard about it, and how many other soldiers and cops that I talked to over the years who have affirmed lots of stories that I remember, lots of things that we went through that I thought was was kind of crazy. And so I've decided we're going to do really a four or five part episode or documentary on Katrina, on the Superdome, and try to cover, you know, what really went on, what was going on, and and how that affected me, how that affected becoming a therapist, how that has helped me do what God has called me to do, but also bring in some other guests, police officers, maybe government officials, some other people who have been in the military with me who have experienced this devastating situation. So for those that don't know this episode, I'm going to just give an overview about what Katrina was, what was going on at the time, and hopefully that'll set up the next episodes and stories so people understand. So Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005. So it was August 29th. And it was a Category 5 Atlantic hurricane, and it hit the Gulf really strongly. It was one of the only hurricanes that kind of hit the Gulf as a Category 4 or 5. And it was the deadliest and most costly natural disaster in U.S. US history. And the fact that it was done in 2005, before, right before the smartphone. I mean, the smartphone didn't come out until 2007. So videos, news sources... You know, people having personal views of the situation from other people's handheld devices and cameras just didn't happen. The other problem was is that because we were trapped in the Superdome and trapped down in New Orleans, and very few people knew how bad it was until, you know, it was already three or four or five days into it, there was no, you know, news media down there with cameras walking around filming things or in the Superdome. There's, you know, if you Google this, if you Google Hurricane Katrina Superdome, there was only, you know, you know, maybe a hundred pictures. I mean, there, there's not much to look at and what you do look at looks devastating, but it's from usually from helicopter shots from far away. There's a few close ups and, and, and things here and there, but there's just not a lot in comparison to what you, you could see. And so there's one documentary that's been put out and a few books, but nothing based on what it was really like to go through the Superdome and what it was like to be there and be involved in that from a National Guard perspective, from an Army perspective, from, you know, a first-person POV. So I'm going to try to tell that story. Other things about Katrina, just kind of summary. So Hurricane Katrina was formed in the Bahamas. It started in about August 23rd. It initially kind of went towards Florida, but it it didn't land there. It, it landed kind of as a Category 1 there, and then it spun back out and got more sh- strengthened as it hit the warm waters in the Gulf of Mexico, and then it became a Category 5. And the winds, they say, were somewhere up around 175 miles an hour, and it hit Louisiana on the 29th as a Category 3. I said 4 earlier, but it hit as a 3 technically, and kind of on the back half of that, you know, four, you know, 3 or 4. It was insane how much damage it did how much water came into New Orleans. It was basically, you know, an ocean over the entire city and all over the all over the other area. Now, you know, people who hear this, you know, there's lots of other areas that were hit, and I'll try to do some good research on that. So as we talk about it, you know, we're not just focusing on New Orleans, but for me and my story, it was New Orleans. It was the Superdome, and that's why we had such a big problem with it. I remember being in the Superdome, and, you know, there was people had handheld radios with batteries, and they were discussing – 
when the levees broke and that was probably day two or three and there was you know the news outlets were putting out that the national guard had blown the levees or that the army of engineers had come in and blown the levees to be able to you know let some of the pressure off and so of course that increased riding and that created increased increased violence towards us and you know increased chaos for everybody involved and you know there's no proof that that's not true but over time you know people have done research and looked into it and just you know seen that like it was a, a multiple faceted issues with why the levees broke and why they weren't able to hold and, and we'll talk about some of that as well some of the reports you know say there was almost 2,000 people that died from that event and that's in my opinion minimizing we saw tons of deaths tons of people who drowned you know and then if you count deaths that were not just directly from you know drowning but were from medical issues or from people not you know being dehydrated children who didn't have care who passed away you know the the death toll is a lot higher than 1800 but that's kind of what they projected it as it was estimated damage for the city and for the you know the state of 125 billion dollars so it was the most expensive hurricane in history i think Ivan might have come after it or Ian, I can't remember which one, but it that one was up there around that as well, but not near as devastating to infrastructure and for a long term economical, you know, problems. And then the, the other problem was the response and the recovery. You know, it was the most one of the most, you know, heavily criticized responses from federal, from state, from local governments. I mean, it was horrendous the amount of support and resources and planning that went into that. The you know, the news from Hurricane Katrina that everybody needed to leave and evacuate only started about 40 hours before it hit landfall. And so it was complete chaos. And you can see the pictures and hear stories of basically the entire city of New Orleans and, and, the, and the cities around New Orleans needed to leave and come towards North Louisiana. So there, just for New Orleans, there was 484,000 people who needed to leave. And at the time, 65% of those people were below the po- lived below the poverty line. So every, you know, everybody who could leave tried to leave. Some people, of course, stayed because they didn't think it was a big deal. And they have experienced hurricanes their entire life. But there were 100,000 people left who couldn't afford to leave. And so 30,000 of those people ended up in the Superdome without food, without water, without electricity. And there were about 250 of us military members who were there. And we got there the day before. So to go back, you know, I had, I had been deployed to Afghanistan in 2003. So we got back at the end of 2003 after nine months of being overseas as combat engineers. And so, you know, I come back and was still dealing with depression and anxiety and PTSD from that kind of stuff. Um, I was living in Alexandria at the time. And, you know, I had some friends from the National Guard who I'd come become close with over in Afghanistan, but most of them lived in Ruston, Louisiana. And so we, I decided after having a mental health crisis and going to therapy after months of getting therapy, I was like, I got to get out of Alexandria. I got to do something different. And so I moved to Ruston to go to Louisiana Tech to get my bachelor's in psychology and reconnected with some of my army buddies and, and some of the people I got deployed with Afghanistan. And so after, you know, I, I, I did 2004 at Tech, really just kind of muddled around trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And then 2005 comes around. We did a couple of hurricane activations, I think Abbeville and maybe something else in between. And then Hurricane Dennis happened in July of 2005. And so that was my, my, I'm really, I was really close at the time to my grandparents. They were, you know, kind of my, the only healthy adults in my life at the time, my parents being divorced and the people that I kind of looked up to the most and would live right next to and and helped raise me. And it was their 50th wedding anniversary. And I had missed, you know, something else for them because of being deployed, but their 50th wedding anniversary was coming up and all of my family was throwing them a huge party and I had to go down and be deployed for Dennis. And so I missed their 50th wedding anniversary and I go down for Dennis. This was only like three weeks. I think it was, let me look at the day, July 10th, 2005. So, you know, six weeks ahead of Katrina coming. So I'm at Louisiana tech, I'm taking classes, you know, I'd gotten back from Afghanistan, done deployments, you know, trying to get my life together, not doing real great with all that. And this, this Dennis happens and it hits and it's, it's, you know, not devastating at all. We, we go down to new Orleans, we get activated at the time. So in the national guard, 
you have what's called a ready reaction team. And at the time we had pagers. So right, this 2005, so we have flip phones and pagers. And what you have to do is you have to keep your pager on you at all times during the month that you are the special reaction team. And if you get a page, you show up and you help. Well, <clears throat> the month before that, we got deployed down to New Orleans for Hurricane Dennis. So I'm missing my, my grandparents, basically, you know, the closest people to me in my life who I love the most at the time. And I'm missing their 50th wedding anniversary. I'm the oldest grandchild. I'm the only grandson. So very close to them my whole life. And man, it was just really frustrating to go down and be deployed to something where we show up, you know, down in New Orleans, we show up at the Superdome, we show up to different places to try to help. And nobody really is there. There's probably, I don't know, 1200 people that are milling about homeless people, low income, you know, people who need help. And so we help them and, and the hurricane, you know, basically hits and, and doesn't do much. We don't have to deal with it. We just are really hot and really tired. Well, we only stay three or four days and then they wrap us back up and say, okay, there's nothing really to do here. And so we went home. So we stayed at Jackson Barracks during that time. And Jackson Barracks is in, is in, you know, a little bit above New Orleans. And we, you know, hung out. I remember sleeping in this like gym that they had. It was hot and annoying. And there were, again, there was really nothing to do. We, we showed up different places to try to unload some food and some water and help people, but nothing, you know, it didn't even really rain. And so we come back and I'm just furious, you know, I'm frustrated that we, I missed my grandparents wedding anniversary for nothing basically. And that was the frustrating time in history of being in the national guard is that we got deployed for all kinds of things. And it's like, well, we did sign up for that obviously. And we want to help, but Sometimes you felt like you just got deployed to, to go 10 to nothing. And sometimes that's the job. And so, but as a 19 year old, 20 year old kid, you know, you're selfish and you're frustrated and annoyed. But at this point, I think I'm 20, 21, 22. So four or five weeks later, we, I remember we had, we had went out the night before. <clears throat> and so I'm sleeping in on a, I think it was a Friday or Saturday and we get, I get woken up by a knock on the door and, and my roommate, Jeff at the time, Jeff Nelson, shout out to Jeff Nelson. Um, he, he's like, Hey man, you know, our pagers are going off. My phone's blowing up. Sergeant Knight is calling us who at the time was our first sergeant. No, not our first sergeant. He was our platoon sergeant. He became first sergeant later. And they're asking us, Hey, you know, there's this hurricane that's coming. So this is probably the 29th, 28th, 27th, probably 28th, something like that. And they want us to, you know, come down to the unit. And I remember laying in bed and it was like, man, I do not want to go do that. That's super annoying and super frustrating. And so they're saying, Hey, you know, you got to, obviously you're get, you know, we're getting deployed to go down there. And I remember laying there and thinking, how do I get out of this? You know, to be completely honest, like I'm a 21 year old kid. <clears throat> I'm like, I don't want to waste my time. I have school. Like I have to do these things. Like, and I remember praying and laying there and God just being like, you signed up for this. This is what's paying for college. Like, get up, quit being ridiculous. And I was like, okay, you got to do my job. Got to get up. So I remember jumping in the car and, you know, going down to Alexandria and getting to my unit. And I remember it was pretty, pretty late at night at that point and or early in the morning. I can't really remember. And there's a bunch of people sitting in the back of a truck, drinking beer, talking, and I'm like, where is everybody? What is happening? I thought this was like <clears throat> going down. And they're like, yeah, nobody showed up. And so what turned out, you know, we have about 250 people in our unit. Only about 50 or 60 people showed up because they couldn't either get there. They had something they were doing. You know, they had some excuse, some wedding. They were like me and didn't want to show up because they didn't want to waste their time, whatever. And so we had to pack everything up, get all of our equipment, get all of our gear and, you know, drive down to new Orleans because we're going to do this thing again where this hurricane's happening. Well, as that day is happening and as we're packing everything up, obviously Katrina is coming up in the Gulf and we see how big and so how huge and how massive and how crazy it is. And, you know, we realize, okay, well, this is different than the last one. And this is going to be, you know, a major problem. And the news outlets were saying the same thing. They were, you know, this is, this is crazy. So I remember, you know, packing up and getting everything on the convoy to go down to New Orleans and just being like, okay, here we go. This is wild. And I'll never forget driving down there, you know, in, in our convoy, the whole southbound lane is there's zero cars. And so the entire way down there from Alexandria at Camp Borgard all the way down to New Orleans. So, you know, I don't remember how many miles that is, but there's nothing but cars coming the other way. And it was just, 
there's pictures and I'll post some of those in the video and on YouTube, but it, it was just insane to see the, the hundreds of thousands of people trying to come up from South Louisiana. And so, you know, that began the, the course of, you know, changed my life, changed the history of, I think, you know, American history when it comes to devastation. And we got down there to Jackson barracks and I remember we, we stationed at Jackson Barracks so that we could go over to the Superdome the next, the, you know, in the next couple of hours. And I remember it was there was a TV playing and there was a news kind of weatherman and he was saying, you know, hey, he was showing a map and he, he literally said on the television, we're not joking. You've got to get out of here. Everybody has to evacuate, mandated evacuation, get out. Because if you're here and he was pointing to Jackson Barracks or below, you're going to die. Like if you don't get out, you're going to die. And I remember we were sitting in Jackson Barracks watching that and then planning on driving further south to the Superdome. And we were just like, well, that's great news. You know that that that's what's going to happen to us if we're here. And so, you know, it it was wild. And so anyway, that's kind of the beginning of the story. That's what I wanted to, to talk to you guys about and kind of prep you for. And so we get there, we get to the Superdome, and I want to tell the story from that point moving forward, what it was like to get down there and load these people into the Superdome. Katrina hits, it's devastation, what it did to the city, you know, us coming out of the next day, the next night, and seeing that, you know, and experiencing that and being in the dome as it rips the roof off and as things change. And then the next, you know, five to six days of being down in New Orleans at the at the Superdome stuck without water, without food, without electricity. We had MREs and some cases of water for us, but we had to split that between 30,000 people. So it was pretty, pretty low materials and, and things that we had. And so we eventually, right after three or four days, the Coast Guard started dropping water to us. But again, this is 2005. There was no comms. We didn't have any special gear. We couldn't really communicate with anybody outside. All the cell phone towers were down. And so it took a lot, you know, for us to finally be able to communicate with the government and with the National Guard and with our unit to get people to send us help. Nobody knew what was going on. And so that was insane. And then you know, five, six days later, finally the water had receded enough for people to start to get to us and try to relieve us and give us help and and try to figure out what was going on. And then, you know, the next couple of days they sent in everybody, you know, all, everybody came in the, their army Rangers, the, you know, special forces like Blackwater, you know, all of these people came in to quote unquote, clean the streets of new Orleans up and protect everybody. But nobody was doing that the first five or six days except for us. And, and so I want to tell that story and for people to hear it and, and just know what happened in history. And, and if anybody's listened to this now and you have some input on that story or something that you think is worthy of being told, I would love to hear from you. You can email me at clintdaviscounseling at gmail.com. If you are a part of that in any way and you would like to add to that, I would love to get a robust kind of telling of that story because I think it's important for us to look back on what life was like for those people, for us, and to to see its effects on our state and our culture and our ec- economics and, and all the things that have been going on. And it just, it's never been told. And so I think it's a, it would be an interesting take and story to tell. Some of the high points that, that I've looked up over the years is, like I said, there are about 30,000 people in the Superdome. There were 6,500 inmates at one of the prisons who were not evacuated. And the guards just left the prisoner, prisoners there. Um, I can remember seeing them wave out the window as we were driving by, picking people up and bringing them back to the Superdome, which is a whole other story. You know, there was tons of shooting and violence and death and, and rapes and child, child abduction. And, you know, anything that you can imagine was going on in the Superdome while we were there. And we didn't have weapons for the first, I think, 48 hours or more. Uh, we had no, you know, none of our, no way of protecting ourselves because at the, at that point it was a humanitarian mission. And then after things got chaotic, we didn't have weapons in the beginning. And, and at one point it, they switched it over to martial law and we were able to get our weapons. And I remember running up to the seventh floor of the Superdome and, and trying to get those weapons to get out to be able to stop what was going on, which I'll tell that story later. But it was just pure chaos. And so it's something that I don't think people know what really happened. And I think people need to know. And so that's going to be the story. I hope you guys will tune in. I hope to do it over the course of the next year leading up to the 20th anniversary. So I'll try to put out four or five, six episodes just documenting and talking through what people went through, how it affected them, 
And my hope is, is that someone would pick it up and tell that story on a, on a massive scale. But the bigger picture is, is for people to find hope in suffering. You know, I, I recovered from those things and, and those things led me to becoming a counselor and a therapist and a minister. And, you know, I, I, I would have never thought I'd go back to New Orleans. I, n- I would have never thought that I would go back to the Superdome. And after several years of therapy and, you know, almost a decade later, I went back for my first Saints game. And I remember, you know, almost having a panic attack trying to get in there. And then I went back the next year and the next year with my buddy Aaron. And by the third time or fourth time I was there, I, I didn't realize that, I, you know, it was good until halfway through the game. I realized I hadn't freaked out or had any kind of symptoms. And then eventually went down and did mission trips and helped serve different churches in New Orleans and to give back and to really help those people. And and so it's it's cool to see that God can use the worst circumstances of your life and it can shape you for better things. And he can use those things for your good and for the good of others and for his kingdom. And I just want people to see and hear that story of how good God is and what he can do in the midst of total chaos and total disaster and total failure on human part, you know, that that we need God and he is good and then he comes through. So I hope you'll stick with me with that. I hope this was helpful kind of summary and just introductory into Hurricane Katrina and what we're going to talk about. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, please email me. If you have something specific that you would like to hear in it or something that per- personal that comes up for you, that would be helpful. I'd love to put this together in a way that, that, you know, serves everybody. Thank you for listening and God bless and have a good week.